there are many who are curious to know what they should be expecting to witness in 2024. And no, I'm not talking about new car launches or the next big Hollywood flick. We are talking about world-changing events. Nostradamus, the 16th century French astrologer, has made eerily accurate predictions in the past, and it's only fitting to be aware of what we could be experiencing in 2024. Considered as the prophecies and studied for years by many experts, these let us glimpse a worrying future that could mean a 2024 plagued with changes for the human being. Especially, it directly affects the Catholic Church. Can you guess what it is? Let's check in today's video. I'm sure that you will be shocked with all the information that we're about to share. So now, let's get started. Most of us have no idea what's around the corner because we don't have a crystal ball, but there are some people who possess special talents to be able to see into the future. One of those people is a French philosopher and astrologer called Nostradamus. He died more than 450 years ago, but his extraordinary skill means that he left behind predictions for the modern day, including 2023, 2024, and many more years to come. Nostradamus was a French astrologer, born Michel de Nostradam, who was best known for his book Les Prophéties, a collection of 942 poetic quatrains that allegedly predicted future events. He was born on the 14th of December, 1503, and died on the 2nd of July, 1566. Another book, Nostradamus, The Complete Prophecies for the Future, includes the 16th century writings of the philosopher Nostradamus, which have been interpreted by Mario Reading. Concerned about being attacked by the Church for his astrological predictions, the prophecies was written in a combination of Greek, Italian, Latin, and Provençal, with the use of mixed word order to obscure the meaning. Nonetheless, many people have decoded his prophecies and suggest that he correctly predicted various world events. There are many references to natural disasters, man-made calamities, and the deaths of notable people. Academic experts do not believe that Nostradamus had any genuine supernatural prophetic abilities and instead say that the associations made between world events and Nostradamus's quatrains are the result of misinterpretations or mistranslations. These academics also argue that Nostradamus's predictions are very vague, meaning they could be applied to any happening. Nostradamus has allegedly previously predicted many events in history, including, most recently, the death of Queen Elizabeth II in September 2022. He also allegedly foresaw the Great Fire of London in 1666, Hitler's rise to power in 1919, the two world wars from 1914 to 1918 and 1939 to 1945, and even the coronavirus pandemic in 2020. So with such accurate predictions to his name, what has Nostradamus predicted for 2024, and did any of his 2023 predictions come true? Pope Francis is currently in his mid-80s and has suffered health problems in recent times. Could a change in the Holy See be afoot? Nostradamus tackles this subject directly in one quatrain, and it doesn't bode well for the Catholic Church. Nostradamus wrote, Through the death of a very old pontiff, a Roman of good age will be elected. Of him it will be said that he weakens his see, but long will he sit and in biting activity. Astrologers have predicted that Pope Francis may soon have a successor. Reportedly, Pope Francis has been battling health issues for months now. Seen as warm and open, Pope Francis is not charismatic, but is known for his quiet and demure demeanor, his humility, and his simple lifestyle. He is also a social conservative from what some view as the most religiously conservative Catholic nation in Latin America. Cardinal Bergoglio, who has Italian roots, chose the name Pope Francis after an Italian patron saint, Francis of Assisi. 
This new Pope of the People has his work cut out for him as he inherits a global church plagued with internal struggles, intrigue, and sexual scandals. Exactly what kind of an impact a quiet and humble man can have on a global church with entrenched politics remains to be seen. One thing is certain, Pope Francis leads a church that is actively seeking the return of its wayward daughters. He also leads a great church that is prophesied to lead the future king of the north or beast that will arise in Europe. The exact meaning of weaken is of course open to debate. Does he mean the influence of the church will somehow lessen, or is some greater scandal on the way? Time will tell, but if Nostradamus is any indication, the 2020S will continue to bring proverbial interesting times for us all. Recently, Pope acknowledged criticism and health issues, but said in upcoming memoir, he has no plans to retire. Pope Francis says he has no plans to resign and isn't suffering from any health problems that would require doing so, saying in a new memoir, he still has many projects to bring to fruition. Francis, 87, made the comments in an autobiography, Life, My Story Through History, which is being published Tuesday, the 11th anniversary of his installation as Pope. Extensive excerpts were published Thursday in the Italian daily Corriere della Sera. In the memoir, written with Italian journalist Fabio Marchese Ragona, Francis traces key moments of his life and their intersection with world events. World War II, Argentina's military dictatorship, and Vatican intrigue and how they together inform his priorities as Pope. Significantly, he addresses recurring speculation about his health problems, criticism from conservatives, and what both may mean for the future of his pontificate. Such questions have always surrounded the papacy, but the prospect of a papal resignation only became a reality with the late Pope Benedict XVI's historic 2013 retirement. Francis, who had part of one lung removed as a young man, has been battling bronchitis, the flu and cold on and off this winter, and for the past two weeks has asked an aide to read most of his speeches. He had a chunk of his large intestine removed in 2021 and was hospitalized three times last year, including once to remove intestinal scar tissue from previous surgeries to address diverticulosis or bulges in his intestinal wall. In his memoir, he stressed that the papacy is a job for life, but that if a serious physical impediment occurs, he has already penned a letter of resignation that is being held in the Secretariat of State. But this is, I repeat, a distant possibility, because I truly do not have any cause serious enough to make me think of resigning, he said. Some people may have hoped that sooner or later, perhaps after a stay in the hospital, I might make an announcement of that kind, but there is no risk of it. Thanks be to God, I enjoy good health, and as I have said, there are many projects to bring to fruition, God willing. Francis acknowledged that critics inside the Vatican and out have accused him of destroying the papacy and have tried to block the reforms that he was mandated by cardinals to enact as a result of his 2013 election. There was a strong desire to change things, to abandon certain attitudes, which, sadly, have proved difficult to eradicate, he said. Needless to say, there are always some who wish to put the brakes on reform, who want things to always stay as they were during the days of Pope Kings. In the memoir, Francis doubled down on his recent decision to allow Catholic priests to bless same-sex couples and denied that the criticism that erupted could split the church. Africa's bishops as a whole, as well as individual conservative bishops around the world, have said they would not follow the new directive. I just want to say that God loves everyone, especially sinners, and if my brother bishops, according to their discernment, decide not to follow this path, it doesn't mean that this is the antechamber to schism because the church's doctrine is not brought into question, Francis said. 
He reaffirmed his support for civil unions while ruling out gay marriage, saying, It is right that these people who experience the gift of love should have the same legal protections as everyone else. He reasoned that Jesus spent time with people who lived on the margins of society, and that is what the Church should be doing today with members of the LGBTQ plus community. Make them feel at home, especially those who have been baptized and are in every respect among God's people, he said. And those who have not been baptized and would like to be, or who would like to be godfathers or godmothers. Let them be welcomed, please. Let them follow a careful pathway to personal discernment. Let's see the citing of preface by Pope Francis. Every man, every woman, every believer, we are all a gift from the Lord, a very precious gift. Each of us is a gift for everyone and for the whole church, taking flesh in a context, in a time, in a specific place. We are concrete gifts for concrete people, and in this way we are also a gift for all, in the simplicity of the life we live. Indeed, the more we grow in friendship with the Lord and with others, the more the harshness, the hardness, the incompatibilities are smoothed out or more aptly cease to be an obstacle to communion and paradoxically become our unique and unrepeatable way of being, the specific colour of the gift that we are for others. We are all gift then, and yet the Church recognises in the saints people who are a gift in a somewhat broader, that is, universal way, that is why they are canonised, so that their existence and friendship can also reach people, places, contexts, and times that are not those closest to them. For the saints are brothers and sisters so resembling Jesus that they can be sure references for every child of God, so that we may all be more united to the Father and to our brothers and sisters, more like Jesus, more united as brothers and sisters among ourselves. I know many have a vague feeling, suspicion, or some concerns about Pope Francis, or even a strong belief that Pope Francis is, or could possibly be, the false prophet, the last Pope. There are many Catholics who believe that Pope Francis is in fact the very false prophet who precedes the Antichrist written about in Holy Scripture and foretold in prophecy. I am not here to attack, insult, or slander the Pope or the Holy Catholic. Please take courage and simply trust in Jesus Christ and know that His Word is always the truth and is always fulfilled. Evil may have its hour, but God will have His day. The Bible is the mirror that shows exactly who that person is. We need to check everything according to the Bible. And now, it's time for us to dive deeper into each problem to solve them all. Will Pope Francis be our last Pope? With all the talk on Catholic websites, blogs, and social media sites for Pope Francis's resignation, it is surprising there isn't more attention being given to the prophecy of the popes. These prophecies were first published in 1595 by Benedictine monk Arnold Wyon in his Lignum Vitae, a history of the Benedictine order. Wyon attributed the prophecies to the 12th century St. Malachy of Ireland. However, other scholars believe Michel de Nostradame as its likely author. In fact, a recent new documentary, The Prophecy of the Popes by French director François Barre, explores this topic in depth and presents a convincing case for both Nostradamus writing them and the prophecy's uncanny accuracies. Are we living in the times of the last Pope in Church history? Although Catholics aren't required to accept any of these prophecies, it certainly seems that there is some cause for alarm, given Pope Benedict XVI's sudden resignation five years ago and the selection of Pope Francis. If the prophecies are correct, then Pope Francis would be our last Pope. While critics have questioned the authenticity of the prophecies, many scholars and even clergy have come to its defense, citing the incredible accuracy of the descriptions of the future popes. Most chilling of all the prophecies is the last one. In the final persecution of the Holy Roman Church, there will sit Peter the Roman, who will pasture his sheep 
in many tribulations, and when these things are finished, the city of seven hills, Rome, will be destroyed, and the dreadful judge will judge his people. The End Indeed, many church events today bear witness to this reality, that indeed the Roman Catholic Church is severely being persecuted, both by outside forces as well as by wolves in sheep's clothing that are within the church herself. We know that prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ, there will be many tribulations that the church and the faithful will have to bear. The prophecy also foretells the coming destruction of Rome, and says that Peter the Roman will be the final pope. Other prophecies have pointed out that in the end times there will reign a false pope who will create a false church. In fact, Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich, one of the greatest mystics of all time, saw a vision of the end times, where she saw the baleful relationship between two popes and how the false church grew and size. The church-approved apparitions of Our Lady of La Salette likewise predicted Rome will lose the faith and become the seat of the Antichrist. If there will be a false pope in the end times, as predicted by these mystics, is Peter the Roman a reference to Pope Francis? Should faithful Catholics believe these prophecies to be a wake-up call for us? Are we witnessing the prelude to these end times, as we see our church torn apart by divisions, horrible clerical crimes, and calls for Pope Francis's resignation? As faithful Catholics, we know that the end times will come yet we do not know the hour or the day when that will happen. We also know that in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus promises the end, times will look eerily similar to what we are witnessing today. I have come to set the earth on fire, and how I wish it were already blazing. Do you think that I have come to establish peace on the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. Jesus also said to the crowds, When you see a cloud rising in the west, you say immediately that it is going to rain. And so it does. And when you notice that the wind is blowing from the south, you say that it is going to be hot. And so it is. You hypocrites! You know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and the sky. Why do you not know how to interpret the present time? This, then, may be the beginning of the present time that leads to the end times. Only time will tell. It should not be a cause for faithful Catholics to lose their faith. Our faith is in Jesus Christ, not the flawed human leaders who run our church. Is the Pope or the next Pope the Antichrist? There are many speculations about the identity of the Antichrist, the uniquely evil end times world leader. One of the most frequent victims of this speculation is the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church. In the days of the Protestant Reformation, Martin Luther and some of the other reformers were convinced that the Pope of that time was the Antichrist. Popes John Paul II and Benedict XVI were commonly identified as the Antichrist. The current Pope, Francis Perfis, will likely be an equally popular target. Why is this? Is there anything in the Bible that would indicate that a pope will be the Antichrist? The speculation about the pope possibly being the Antichrist revolves primarily around Revelation 17, 9, describing the evil end-time system symbolized by a woman riding a beast, Revelation 17, 9 declares, This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. In ancient times, the city of Rome was known as the city on seven hills, because there are seven prominent hills that surround the city. So the thinking goes, we can know that it is somehow connected with Rome. So if the evil end-time system is somehow associated with Rome, it does not take much thought to see a potential connection with the Roman Catholic Church, which is centered in Rome. Numerous passages in the Bible describe an Antichrist who will lead the Antichrist movement in the end times. So, if the end times evil world system is centered in Rome and led by an individual, the Pope is a likely candidate. However, many Bible commentators say 
the woman cannot be the Catholic Church and the seven hills cannot refer to Rome. They cite the fact that Revelation 17, 18, clearly identifies the woman riding the beast as the city of Babylon. In addition, verse 10 plainly states that the seven hills symbolize seven kings, five of which have fallen, one is, and one is to come. Clearly, this cannot refer to the seven hills of Rome. Rather, this is a reference to seven world empires ruled by the seven kings. At the time of the Revelation, five world empires had come and gone, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece. One Rome existed, and one Antichrist's world empire had not yet come. Whoever the Antichrist turns out to be, the important thing is to be warned of his coming and learn to recognize him and all who possess his spirit. 1 John 4 2. 3 tells us how to identify the spirit of the Antichrist. By this, you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. The current Pope, Francis Patsitsin, acknowledges Jesus as being from God and Jesus as coming in the flesh. While we disagree with Pope Francis and on numerous areas of Catholic doctrine, his view of the person of Jesus Christ is biblical. Therefore, it's hard to believe that Pope Francis Bobfuns is the Antichrist. While we believe it is possible for a Pope to be the Antichrist, the Bible does not give specific enough information to be dogmatic. A future Pope very well may be the Antichrist, or perhaps the Antichrist's false prophet. If so, this future Pope will be clearly identified by a denial of Jesus as coming in the flesh. Nostradamus's corroboration of the Bible time frame. Is there any evidence from Nostradamus that he was using the Bible time frame and working according to the Jubilees? Yes. There is such evidence, and it appears he was working along these lines using the date of 2020 for the world peace we expect from the subjugation of the nations. In century 10, Quatrain 89, which is placed between predictions of dire events, we see the period of the shortfall of at least seven years and the time of the Jubilee of Jubilees. David Overson recognizes the rare gentleness in this quatrain and holds it to be a brilliant astrological quatrain. It must be remembered that at this time, astrology and astronomy had not been separated, and this was the accepted way of describing time in long-term events. Overson rightly debunks any reference to 1945 based on subsequent events and then renders the quatrain as follows. The walls will be reduced from brick to marble, seven and fifty peaceful years, joy to humans, renewed the aqueduct, health, great fruit, joy, and sweet times. The seven and fifty peaceful years are a jubilee plus seven years. It could thus be deduced, given the constraints of the other prophecies he made and the Catholic prophecies themselves referred to herein, to refer to the seven years prior to the Jubilee in 2027, and the fifty years refers to the great Jubilee of Jubilees in 2028 to 2077. Overson refers to Rodney Collin attempting to draw up a fifteen-year cycle to war, who says that, in fact, war is continuous and peaks seem only to represent its moments of maximum tension. To understand this peace prophecy of Nostradamus without external reference, he then resorts to the explanation of the air trigons rather than refer simply to the biblical calendar. Joy to humans renewed the aqueduct, health, great fruit, joy, and sweet times. This represents the joy to mankind we might expect of the bounty after an extensive Third World War and the restoration of Messiah. The last seven years of war and the restoration of Messiah are over the same period of time as we see from the other texts. The granting of health is from the text at Ezekiel 47, 6, 
12. Ezekiel 47, 6, 12. And he said to me, Son of man, have you seen this? Then he led me back along the bank of the river. As I went back, I saw upon the bank of the river very many trees on one side and on the other. And he said to me, This water flows toward the eastern region and goes down into the Arabah, and when it enters the stagnant waters of the sea, the water will become fresh. And wherever the river goes, every living creature which swarms will live, and there will be very many fish. For this water goes there, that the waters of the sea may become fresh, so everything will live where the river goes. Ten fishermen will stand beside the sea. From Engedi to Eneglaim, it will be a place for the spreading of nets. Its fish will be of many kinds, like the fish of the great sea. But its swamps and marshes will not become fresh. They are to be left for salt. And on the banks, on both sides of the river, there will grow all kinds of trees for food. Their leaves will not wither, nor their fruit will fail, but they will bear fresh fruit every month, because the water for them flows from the sanctuary, their fruit will be for food, and their leaves for healing. The warning of Jeremiah 4.15 is to be undertaken by the Church of God in preparation for the coming of the Messiah. This is to be done by modern communications using satellite technology and the Internet, which was the concept of the alarm coming from the sky. This will bring back to life the great king of Angoumoua. The king of Angoumoua was the Messiah as head of the true church, which at the time of Nostradamus was persecuted almost into extinction and later resulted in the transfer of the Huguenots to Protestant Trinitarianism and their transplanting in South Africa and elsewhere in the Commonwealth. However, at the time of Nostradamus, they were Unitarian Sabbatarians of the Waldensian system, persecuted under the Albigensian Crusades. They had some protection under the Counts of Toulouse and also Francis Berthomei, who appears in other references of Nostradamus. Thus, we are looking at the concept of a play on calendars, both pagan and biblical. The Gregorian calendar did not come into general use in France until 1582, well after this quatrain and Nostradamus's writing. The rulers of months and the months themselves were seen as being equated. The king of the seventh biblical month is the Messiah who comes at trumpets. This was the angel of great council of Isaiah 9, six in the Septuagint, identified with Jesus Christ by the early and pre-Reformation church. The seventh month of the solar calendar is ruled by Leo, who represents the sun. The archangel who represented this sign in early theology was Michael. The archangel Michael is the great prince who was identified as the defender of Israel and the defender of the church and head of the angels of heaven and the angel of the Old Testament. Thus, Michael was identified as Jesus Christ by the pre-Reformation Waldensian or Albigensian system and subsequent churches of God. So, we are dealing with the activities of Jesus Christ here and through his servants, the elect in the church. It does not matter which way this text was interpreted in terms of the pagan solar calendar or the Bible lunisolar calendar, the advent of the Messiah. People will be in no doubt as to the coming of the Messiah. Moreover, he will be preceded by a series of activities. The first is the warning of the last days and the clear speaking of prophecy so that people at the end times may understand. God does nothing except that he first warns the people through his servants, the prophets. The next phase is the rule of the two witnesses who speak with great power and authority from Jerusalem and have the power to shut the heavens and bring fire down from heaven during the period of the ministry. They will be opposed by the false prophet, killed, and then left in the streets for three and one half days. Then the Messiah will come. He will slay the false prophet with his coming and remove all false religion from Jerusalem and the environs and progressively from the world. From that time, 
all of the nations will be subject to the nexus of the law of God for one thousand years, and then in and from the second resurrection. This planet will then be run according to the laws that Christ gave to Moses at Sinai as a mediator for the one true God. From that time on, the demons will be placed in the bottomless pit until they are to be judged at the end of the millennial system. The Messiah will establish his system. At present, the false religious teachers are saying that the Antichrist will establish the law of Moses from Jerusalem. That is exactly what the Bible says Messiah will do. We will examine that aspect in the papers on the Antichrist and Antichrist in early church theology and the last days. What we can be sure of by that time is that the entire Trinitarian system in Europe will be destroyed. Every black cassocked priest in their system will be either dead or on their knees in abject repentance, and their system will be no more. This will all be within the sign of Jonah and the Jubilee of 2027. This evil and adulterous generation looks for a sign, but there shall be no sign given it other than the sign of Jonah. It shall become worse than the worst days of Sodom and Gomorrah in these last days. They will not repent, and thousands of millions of people will die needlessly, simply because of a false religion and the work of demons that will not obey the laws of the living God and His calendar system. Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her judgment. Well, that's all about today's video. If you enjoy this video, please give us a like and subscribe to our channel. Thank you so much for watching and hope to see you in the next videos. Goodbye.